Welcome to Life-Giving Water Messages, where I expound upon the Word of God and, through the internet, deliver it to you. My name is Rev. Todd Laddick, and as many of my listeners know, I'm an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church of Greater New Jersey, where I serve. And uh, our bishop, Bishop John Scholl, has invited clergy to take a two-week renewal leave. And so uh, he has prepared a message for uh, all of you and our congregations to listen to. Uh, And uh, so I wanted to share it with you, my listeners. So listen in to what uh, Bishop John Scholl has to say, and hopefully God will speak to you through his message. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now we're going to hear uh, two scripture passages, and the first scripture passage is going to be read for us uh, by Hector Burgos. We invite him to come at this time. The Word of God comes to us from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verses 1 and 28. In the 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, I was with the exiles at the Sheba River when the heavens opened and I saw a vision of God. Just as a rainbow lights up a cloud on a rainy day, so it brightness shone all around. This was how the form of the Lord's glory appeared. When I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the sound of someone speaking. Thank you so much, Hector. We give thanks to God for you and your leadership. And now we're going to hear uh, the second scripture reading. And uh, Sangwon Do, who is the district superintendent of the Raritan Valley District, uh, is going to come and read about the Epiphany story, or what we often associate with Epiphany, uh, the visitation of the three kings or the Magi. Sangwon? Today's Gospel reading is from uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard that this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the peoples, chief priests, and teachers of the Lord, law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On the coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and the myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thank you so much, Sangwon. Will you pray with me? God, in these moments, we pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, and that you would open our eyes so that we might hear you and experience you, and know you. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Move beyond my preparation and this congregation's expectation, and catch us all by surprise with your word that is ever renewing in our hearts. All this we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 
Well, as I mentioned to you, today I'm going to be talking about the epiphany. And uh, epiphany essentially means uh, God's manifestation, uh, God's very presence uh, being made known to us. And uh, there are so many different epiphany stories in the Bible. You know, for instance, when Moses uh, experienced the burning bush, that was an epiphany for him. He saw God, he experienced God, he learned what God wanted him to do. Uh, when uh, Jesus went up to the mountain and uh, two of his disciples went with him and, and there was the transfiguration and, and again, God was made known uh, to them. Epiphanies are very important. And that's what happened with the Magi, the, the three kings as they traveled. Uh, they met God at the birth of Jesus. You know, I've had uh, different epiphanies in my own life. And um, each one of them has been special to me and a, and a marker in my life uh, that has actually has uh, either changed or altered or reinforced or helped me to grow. And I, I think that's what epiphanies are all about. They're, they're really about helping us to be transformed. They're helping us to uh, move in a new direction, uh, to see God in a deeper way, uh, to reflect on our own life and ask, what is God calling us to next? You know, early on in my ministry, um, uh, right after I graduated from seminary, I was uh, assigned, appointed uh, to a church, or actually four churches, in Philadelphia. And there was this cooperative ministry. It was new and it was just starting. And they wanted me to come and help coordinate what these four churches did, particularly in terms of ministry in the community and reaching out to the people in the community. Oh, I was so excited. This is exactly where I wanted to be in, a, in Philadelphia. It was the Frankfurt section of Philadelphia, a very gritty neighborhood. I had a lot of challenges. And it's really where I felt God was calling me. And so I began to work in this ministry and began to work with the people. And there were, there were uh, other clergy there that I was working. And um, one of the things that became very apparent uh, fairly early on is that I was in over my head. I mean, I hadn't had enough experience to really lead a, a significant ministry like that, uh, to be working with clergy colleagues and relationships like that. And quite frankly, I made some mistakes. And... Um, the uh, uh, Staff Parish Relations Committee that oversaw my work, um, they called the district superintendent and they said, you know, we need to talk to you uh, just about John and his leadership and how he's leading and about what we should do. So that was a very difficult time. And the district superintendent invited me to the meeting and the beginning part of the meeting and asked me to talk about the ministry and how I was leading and what I was doing. And then he excused me and um, he told me to stay around, but uh, that I should, uh, you know, be excused from the meeting so that he could talk with the people. And so I went out and I sat on the church steps and I knew that they were talking about me and about whether I was going to stay or whether the district superintendent was going to move me. And I remember sitting there with my head in my hands and sitting on the steps, my, you know, my head down toward my knees, and um, all of a sudden up the street uh, comes this guy. And uh, as he gets close, I can see him out of the corner of my eye, and um, I, I look at him. And he's got a cigar in his mouth, and he's chomping on this cigar. And he says, uh, what's your problem? And I thought, oh, boy, just what I need. You know, do I really need this right now? God, do I really need this right now? And then he said, uh, you don't have a problem. You've got four problems. And I thought, wow, I've got four churches I'm trying to work with here. And then he went on and he talked and he shared things. And uh, as he shared, he was uh, actually talking about me. And I had never seen this guy before. It was a hot summer day. He had a little bag uh, uh, with him. And he said he had just bought some Briars ice cream, vanilla ice cream. And I thought, gosh, as long as you're standing here talking to me, that ice cream's melting all in that bag. He had these uh, high top. Chuck sneakers, you know, Converse sneakers on. He had shorts on, a T-shirt. And um, at, toward the end, or at the end, he said to me, I just want you to know, it's going to be all right. 
And then he walked away. I never saw him again. Never saw him again. A few minutes later, the district superintendent came out of the building and saw me on the top, uh, on the steps, and said, uh, John, why don't you go back inside and talk with the people? It's going to be all right, and uh, we're going to leave you here. And I stayed for another eight years. I served 12 years in that appointment, and it was a great ministry for me. I learned a lot. I grew a lot. They taught me a lot, and I was richly blessed by the experience. And you know, that guy on that street was God's epiphany for me, that in the midst of everything I was feeling, this was God speaking to me, that I was going to be all right. And sure enough, I made more mistakes, but you know what? I was okay, because God loved me, and the people around me supported me in growing in my leadership. Today, I want to talk to you about how you can experience epiphanies in your life. They won't be just like mine. Everybody's epiphanies are unique, but God is wanting to speak to you. God has a plan for your life. God has a, has, has a purpose and meaning for your life. And God wants to talk with you and be made to known to you. Now, I'm going to talk about three ways that we can see and know God. The first is through observation. The second is through quieting. And the third is through curiosity. Observation. You know, one of the great philosophers of our time, uh, Yogi Berra, you know him. He played for the New York Yankees, uh, was the catcher, star catcher. Um, he's in the Hall of Fame. He's deceased now. But you know what lives on behind him? Not only his record, but all the things that he said along the way. And he had all of these uh, sayings that he would say that were just kind of humorous. But one of the things that he said is, you can learn a lot by watching. You can learn a lot by watching. And sure enough, that's true. Observation is, is one of the ways that um, we can learn a whole lot about life, about ourselves, and also about God. You know, I already talked about observing God in nature, um, but we can also see God in people. You know, I'm reading a book right now uh, that's, in, that's entitled, The Body Keeps Score. The body keeps score. Wow, what a powerful title. And it's actually about trauma and people who have gone through trauma and how that affects their body and particularly how it affects their brain. And the writer of the, of the book is, is talking about an early experience he had in his life. And he was uh, working with a doctor, a mentor who was teaching him, and they were on rounds. And um, he uh, asked the, his mentor, his doctor, he said, um, is this patient that we just saw, is he uh, schizophrenic or is he schizo-ineffective? And the doctor thought for a moment and he said, I think we should call him Michael McIntyre. Wow. You know, how often do we do that? That we label somebody with a, with a label that then impacts their life or certainly impacts how we see them. And what does it mean just to think of people and to see people for who they are and to call them by name rather than giving them a label, rather than seeing them through a lens that's not who God has really made them. You know, obs obser observing people is all about first seeing the person as a person. God can never speak to you if you only see the person as a label. You know, I, to be honest with you, I, God broke through that when that guy was walking up the street and, and I, I saw him as somebody that just didn't seem normal, uh, certainly didn't seem like a church person. I wasn't sure I wanted to listen to him. But you know, uh, God broke through, thank God. But, you know, my observation initially was, this guy has nothing to say to me. And when we do that, God doesn't really have a chance to talk to us. You know, that's the problem with Herod. 
He saw that Jesus was being born and was going to be a rival to him, to his own kingship, to his own rulership. And so he, he, he didn't see Jesus and the possibilities of Jesus. He, he just saw him as a threat. How often do we do that? See somebody as a threat. See somebody as a problem. See somebody who's just getting in our way. You know, when we do that, we miss the opportunity for God to speak to us. So first of all, for God to speak to us through somebody else, we need to see them as a person. And then the second thing we need to do is to see that they matter just like we matter, that they are as important as we are. You know, I found out, I found through my, throughout all of my life that often the people who have spoken to me a word of God are often people that others didn't think very highly of. I mean, I just think that's the way God works. God works in the unexpected. And most people miss God because they are putting labels on people or they're not seeing the other person as important as they are. To experience God and the voice of God in others, we have to remain outward, fully outward, present to the person and allow that person to be fully present to us. Now, secondly, to have an epiphany, you've got to quiet yourself. You know, I don't know about you, but it, it happens to me. My, my mind just gets going and going and going. You know, Beverly will say to me sometimes, don't you ever stop thinking? And, you know, for me to hear God, I really do need to quiet myself. Now, quiet myself isn't emptying myself of all that's going on in my mind. Quiet myself isn't emptying myself of all that's going on in my body. It's just putting it in neutral for a period of time. You know how a car is, you drive a car, you put it in forward, you move forward, you can put it in reverse, you can move uh, in reverse, you can put it into different gears, you can give it more gas. But when it's in neutral, it's just steady. It just stays there. The car's still running, but it just stays there. And so one of the things we have to learn how to do is just to put our bodies, our minds in neutral to just, because you can't empty it. I can't empty my mind of everything I'm thinking. I can't empty my mind of the challenges that I'm experiencing. They're all going to be there. But I just need to put my mind in neutral so that God can speak to me. Now here's a couple of ways that I put my mind in neutral. One is I get out in nature. And you know, one of the things that helps me greatest is when there's a far off horizon, when I can see great distance. It just opens me up. It opens me up. Two summers ago, Beverly and I went to Yellowstone Park with some friends. And it's just wide open. And you know, for that week that we were there, I was just so open because my mind was just so opened up to God's nature. So how do you open your mind? How do you get it open? Nature is one way. Another thing I do is I like to watch kids play. That just puts my mind at idle. You know, I can just watch kids play and have a good time and enjoy, and my mind just relaxes and settles. And sometimes I actually have to make a list. You know, when my mind is really churning and it's thinking about all these things, I just make a list so that my mind can just settle and quiet down. I don't know what works for you. Maybe it is nature. Maybe it is seeing uh, things out there. Maybe it is children and watching children play, or maybe it's something else. Uh, maybe it is making a list. Whatever it is, figure it out, because sometimes you've just got to put yourself in neutral, because God often speaks to us when we're in neutral and open to the possibilities. And then lastly, God speaks to us when we are curious. You know, curiosity is one of the greatest gifts we can have, to be wondering about something. What, what does this mean, or what's this, what's this all about, or why is this connected this way? You know, questions can be a good thing. And I always encourage people to ask questions, to discover, to understand, to be curious. Our granddaughter, Nora, is curious. 
as a matter of fact, as she's three years old now, but particularly as she became, a, you know, started to crawl and then started to walk, one of the things she would do is she would pull out drawers and she'd look inside to see what was there. She would open cabinet doors and look inside. As she got a little taller, she'd be op opening closet doors and looking in to see what was in those closets. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was raising my kids and they were doing that, I was like, close that door. Close that, you know, keep everything in order. Keep it all straight. Um, fortunately, they broke through that, and they have these wonderful, curious minds. I want you to be curious, to wonder. And I also want you to encourage curiosity in others. Curiosity is something that God uses us to help us to see something else, to see some other possibility. So... What does it mean for you to begin to be out, uh, to be um, looking at things and observing things? To be outward as you observe. What does it look like for you to begin to quiet yourself so that God can actually speak to you? And then also, what does it look like to be curious about things? Because God speaks through our questions and our wondering. You know... Another epiphany story for me um, was actually uh, in my previous assignment. Um, I had a friend, uh, we were colleagues together in Philadelphia. We were both pastors, had served together. Uh, Helen was a special person. And uh, Helen, Helen was just Helen. You know, she was just Helen. Um, Helen was a local pastor, so she hadn't gone to seminary and graduated from seminary. Um, she went through the local pastor's uh, route. And um, Helen um, was somebody who was just herself. It didn't matter if a bishop was in the room or a pauper. It didn't matter if uh, her district superintendent was there or, or a parishioner. It didn't matter if there was an elected official or somebody very important. Uh, it didn't matter any of those things. Helen was just going to be Helen. And when Helen prayed, she prayed to God. She didn't pray to the people in the room. She didn't put on an air to pray for, for the bishop that was in the room or the district superintendent. She didn't put on an air to pray for any people that were there. Uh, she just prayed to God. And her prayers were powerful. They were powerful. They just drew you in. And, it, and, and she was just so focused. But one of the things uh, Helen had was the gift of hearing God. And once, twice a year, she would contact me with a message from God. Now, the first time it happened, I thought, uh, uh, sure, thanks, Helen, really appreciate that. But then it began to unfold in my life. And there were several times like that. And so I began to listen to Helen every time. And I always asked her to pray for me. And she would pray these deep prayers. And then she would ask me to pray for her. And I'd just fumble around. And, you know, but she was just beautiful. And I'll never forget, <clears throat> my last assignment, um, she came to me and she said, uh, John, I just want you to know um, that God has told me that you're going to be leaving here and that you're going to go to a new assignment. I, I was enjoying where I was and there was more work to, to do. And she said, I, God hasn't told me where you're going to be assigned, but I can see you driving your car. And it's kind of up and down a highway, up and down a highway, but I don't know where it is. You know, I thought of all the places, where, where would that be, you know, driving up and down a highway? And um, sure enough, I was assigned to New Jersey. And gosh, I've done a lot of driving, particularly before COVID, up and down the Garden State, up and down uh, the New Jersey Turnpike, up and down the highway, across 195, back and forth uh, between uh, the, the east and the west sides of New Jersey. And um, I thought, well, God sent me here for a purpose. And sure enough, two months after I landed, Superstorm Sandy, I said, this is what God has called me for. And we began to lead in a great ministry, and people have done amazing things. Then after that, uh, we started Next Gen and the Ignite ministry. And I thought, yes, this is what God has brought me here for. And, you know, there were just different things. But you know what? Here's what I realized along the way. God brought me to greater New Jersey 
to minister to me. That you, the people of greater New Jersey, have just blessed me throughout my time that's been here. I've grown in my understanding and knowledge of so many things. My leadership has grown. You've supported me and challenged me and even helped to steer me and direct me. And you've been a gift from God for me. Another epiphany in my life. Friends, I just want you to stay open. God wants to speak to you. God's got a purpose, a meaning for your life. So keep observing what's happening around you. Keep outward to hear and listen to the people. Stay quiet at times. Just quiet yourself. Put your mind in neutral and be curious. God, what do you have for me next? Will you pray with me? Most merciful God, we give you thanks for all the blessings you share with us. And today, God, we give you thanks that you continue to make yourself known to us. God, we pray that in these days, you would especially be known to us so that we might help heal the people around us, that we might serve others, that we might know how you are calling us to lead. Yes, God, come, make yourself known to us. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.